Good evening. Good evening, all the brave and relentless people who braved UN Week. Um, I'm sure you have lots of stories to tell about how you got here and how long it took, but you can save them all for the reception. Um, and um, we're awfully glad to see you. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the, the honor to serve as director of the Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, it's uh, wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to see our, our auditorium filled again with in-person visitors. So come back, stay well, and uh, it's great that you're here. Um, our traditional uh, format will be followed tonight with a little bit of an exception. Uh, and that is we will have a conversation that will begin in a few minutes. It will be followed by a question and answer period uh, in which we will invite you to participate. And that will be followed by a reception upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's dining room, uh, where we invite you to toast our special guests and also to buy a book, because Lewis Nelson's book will be available upstairs and he will be available to sign it. In fact, it's mandatory that you get a sign <laughs> um, It's a pleasure to welcome Lewis back and, of course, Judy Collins back. Um, and I say welcome back because they have attended many programs. Uh, Judy has participated in, participated in our anniversary program here at Roosevelt House. And um, I'm just happy that we got to do this in person um, after all these months of planning to celebrate Lewis's important book. Um, I want, um, before I move in the program, to offer a special welcome to one of our Board of Advisors members, Tony Stepanski, who is a generous donor at Roosevelt House. And also, I want to welcome um, our chair, Rita Hauser, who is watching on Zoom tonight. And we're always delighted when she is with us. Thank you, thank you, Harold. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here. You can see. Okay. So, I hope you've looked at the bios in the program. Lewis Nelson has been an industrial designer for half a century, right? At least. Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> and he's impacted our lives in many ways um, during our lifetimes, not only with gorgeous public spaces like this on the Washington Mall, but um, the way we find our way through airports, for example, I think they call that wayfinding now, the first nutrition labels on food, which we now take for granted. We always look for them, right? Because we know what it will look like. Well, Lewis designed the first that, that we had on packaging that uh, told us how unhealthy the things we were eating really <laughs> really were. And he's lectured at educational institutions around the country and around the world. And of course, the National Mall. And I have visited the Korean Memorial myself many times. Yes, it's true originally and most often because it's right near the Lincoln Memorial. So it's very convenient for my frequent pilgrimages. But it is still, um, as the Lincoln Memorial is, and we'll talk about that, just dazzling and moving. Um, and the fact that it evokes a forgotten, a largely forgotten war and largely forgotten victims, people who were sacrificed in that war, means that it needs a very powerful ar artistic expression to compete with its surroundings. And Lewis has done that so beautifully. So, Lewis, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for bringing Judy. Um, and thanks for that poem, which is so beautiful in, in to set to music. Um, so, let's start with the mall. It is a, a, a deeply powerful experience to be on the mall. But you have written in the book mosaic, which we should look at the book jacket when, while we're talking, and then I'll show you some other images. Um, you've pointed out that the Vietnam Memorial, as, as acclaimed it as it has begun, as it has become, um, recalls only the dead and not the wounded or the veterans. 
do you think that was a, a, a mistake? Do you think it's something you tried to rectify as you began the project about Korea? I'd like to talk about what I did, not what they didn't do. <laughs> uh, and because, of, because it, I, th I hold, um, I hold the Vietnam Memorial an extraordinary uh, memorial. And uh, because it really was the memorial that helped heal this nation, the United States was in terrible shape, if you think back to that time. And it was through that memorial and what a young lady did in putting that memorial together uh, that brought a nation together and brought the veterans together to that particular time. Of course, it was, it was, a, it was a, an examination as well, uh, and a lot of people didn't like it, but it really served the nation to, to, to continue on. But you raised that point, the, the extraordinary important point, because what I'd like to talk about is, I'd, is really two things. One is Korea, uh, largely because there's a lot of people who don't know a thing about Korea. When this whole thing started in 1950, we didn't know where Korea was. I wasn't. I was going into high school at the time. and. Um, a few years later, I was going into college. And in, uh, in that period of time, I found out that a couple of, uh, probably three or four veterans were coming in, it was in my class, and they were Korean War veterans. They raised the quality of the work that was happening in those classes extraordinarily so that I became a better student at that time because of what they were there. And they were over there and saw the battles that were going on in Korea uh, at the time. So maybe just a, a word about that, you know, that, that, that in, in the sense of Korea, because um, no one knew where it was. Uh, it wasn't much in the papers or the papers that my folks, had. I don't think my folks really knew much about Korea at that time, and maybe a lot of others. But it, it, within a short period of time, we learned a little bit more about it because of the fights that were going on over there. Actually, most of the fighting was over in that initial three-year period. It was a three-year war. And in that war, we lost 30, over 36,000 American men and women who died because of that in three years' time. Uh, we compare back to many, uh, many people think back to Vietnam, and Vietnam lived 58,000 dead. But that was over 25 to 30 years. So the, the price of the war in Korea was extraordinarily high. Um, and as a result of it, uh, it we, you know, we, we look at it in a different kind of way because it was a war that was f our first war that was fought under the auspices of the United Nations, not uh, solely with uh, the authority of Congress. And it was the first war we fought against the Red Chinese. And it was the first war we did not win. It was a draw for all intents and purposes. We didn't win, but we didn't lose it. And in many ways, it looked over a long period of time that it was the forgotten war. And indeed, it was forgotten because no, still nobody knew. But if you think about what had happened in that period of time to Korea, you know, e everything in Korea, the north of, of the 38th parallel to the south of the 38th parallel was demolished. Uh, it, it was essentially was a, peninsula, it was a peninsula of land that became uh, nothing. And the north built up itself under Chinese rule um, in its own way, and the South went through a period of time of, str of strong difficulty uh, until eventually they got the, their problems eventually moved up to the point that if you looked at what had happened in the South and you look at a map, of uh, a satellite map, and you see the mouth basically glowing, and anything north of the 38th parallel is black. There's essentially nothing is up there. If you look at the south and think about the south in, in another kind of way, I was talking with a bunch of people, and 
the last decade of the, of the millennium and into the first decade of this millennium, the gross national product in the South Korea was increasing in double digits every year during that period of time. You, that wasn't happening in, chi in China. It wasn't happening in Japan. It wasn't happening in the United States. The growth of that country is extraordinarily important. So that when Truman sent a few hundred men into Korea, and they were not really prepared to do a fight and to do a, 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 a get involved in a war. They were demolished in many ways uh, until MacArthur brought a t a, an, another kind of in, a group of uh, invasion into Incheon, and eventually we took uh, Seoul. Eventually, then we moved on up and in, into the um, into the uh, the north. And there we were really demolished by the North, Cor the, the, the North Koreans as well as the um, Red Chinese to the point that we pulled back and we, we in about nine, year, nine months of the first year of the war, we're back in the Seoul area and, and things are calm a little bit. And in research that I found, people were, being, were talk talking to themselves that were on the Korean side, the North Korean side and the South Korean side and said, we should get rid of this war and stop this war at that time. This is before we got to one year in the war. It took them two and a half years, basically, to iron out all the difficulties so that at least they had a, a ceasefire. L Lewis, let me break in because we're, we're going to run out of time before we get to the memorial. Yeah. How, let me ask you a question about what you just said because it's a very good lesson in a forgotten history. Did you know all this at the time? I did you learn it in school or did you learn it for preparation for this? No, I, I, I learned it uh, during the process of, uh, uh, of designing this. And I've learned that further after this particular process because I, I was able to talk more with the people and, and look at the history, deeper into the history. Uh, it, when I designed the memorial, I was interested in what people were doing at the time and who were the people. Because the, the basic, the, the, the direction that we had from Congress, but the direction I was, I, I, we, I was assigned a task I was lucky. I was assigned a task to design a mural. And nobody had a subject for the mural. So it was up to me to do that. Danny, the put, the, oh, mural, the, only, put the, the mural back on. So the only thing it. that was standing at the time or required, not was nothing standing, was that Frank Gaylord, who was a sculptor, had a requirement to design or to develop 38 uh, soldiers that would represent the American fighting forces. One for each thousand casualties, right? More well, it was basically one for all, all the, uh, to, to, get a, uh, to get a grouping. I mean, go back and just, the, the, the requirement that was given to Congress because of the difficulties that Vietnam had had was that we had to show all sexes, all genders, all nations, uh, and to, uh, and to, indicate the, the various branches of service. But how did you get, what did you how do? Did is I it a competition? Yeah. Is it an assignment? How do, I'm always interested in how artists get to projects. Uh, or is it like I, such no, an I, inside I was, story I, you I can't share? I was lucky. Uh, the, the chap who took over the uh, design arts program, the Fine Arts Commission, mm -hmm. um, wanted uh, wanted to change the grant program, and so he wanted me to spend some time every year with them, and a bunch of other people as well. So we spent some time, and at that period of time, I met the chap who is a, a, the architect of record for Vietnam, and also would be the new architects of record for the Korean War Veterans Memorial. And one thing led to another, and, and so I had an interview, and I interviewed, there were three or four other people that interviewed, and I got a telephone call about two weeks later, and they selected me. I was very lucky. No, you, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't luck, but it's, a, <laughs> it, at le I, it's, yes, the luck was that you were working with, you started with the Fine Arts Commission. At least it wasn't like the Lincoln Memorial when Daniel Chester French was actually the head of the Fine Arts Commission and managed to give the assignment to himself for the Lincoln Memorial. No, that's, but, but that's there, more but than there are other secrets here. So well, my first task to come up with here is to find out who our neighbors were. 
And in looking at the neighbors, I mean, for, first, because coming into that was understanding then the nature of what a memorial should do. And uh, so you spend time, more time on the mall. Well, than well you the first had, thing right? you know is that one of the, my favorite of the, all the memorials was the Lincoln Memorial. Thank you for everything that you've done for Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, but why does Lincoln, that... But the Lincoln, the Lincoln is an extraordinary memorial. The Lincoln Memorial, by, by uh, data that was accumulated by the Park Service, is the preferred one Park Service destination in the United States, throughout the entire United States. The tenth in all the list is the Korean War Veterans Memorial. Well, that's that pretty people, good. Everywhere one, no question yeah, about just it. Just saying, yeah. Right, so the other thing, so you know, and then but if I thought of all the things that a memorial should do and how to do it, uh, one is that you build a, sculp a sculpture to a wonderful, grand individual who, who mm -hmm. led a nation through a war, and certainly that was Lincoln. The other thing to do is, is that you usually, t traditionally, uh, if you go to all the churches in the, in, in the, in the seabeds uh, and all the all the ships that have been lost at sea, they list the names of those that are lost at sea. So, one of the other traditional things is you write a name, uh, and that becomes part of the birth. And certainly, that's an indication that was done at, uh, for the Vietnam Memorial. Yeah, as, the, as one of the uh, requirements of the design was that they should list the name of those that. The other thing that you do is you build an extraordinary structure that becomes the dominant structure of a, of a facility like, a, like Cleopatra's Needle, only you make it a much bigger one. You, yeah. know, you, you get Washington you Monument, noticed. and therefore we have Washington, so you have ma major mo monuments. So you've got names and you've got sculptures and so forth. What other way is there to recognize uh, and honor anyone is usually through a photograph. Everybody here has a photograph of a loved one. You put that, that photograph on a mantelpiece, you put it on the table, and I said, so I thought we ought to have the portraits of all those that served. And that's how this came about, is essentially that I gave that idea to uh, the generals that were in charge of the, of the, the solution. They immediately thought that was the best idea that they had. So that the, the the sculptures would be the, uh, the the portraits would be taken by Army and Navy or Air Force photographers in Korea between 1950 and 1953, and they would represent all the men and women and all the nationalities and all the jobs and the different divisions, whether these Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, that were. In, in Korea at that time. Lewis, what's the material? <coughs> because we're all looking at it, and for those who have not visited, how, it's, it's, it's just granite. But the faces are, they're just in the granite? Is the, it some the, kind of application? The, the faces. Well, or is it too much I've, of a I've trade figured, secret? I've, I've, we weren't that a way of doing it. And, and w I think we were original at the time. This was in 1992, probably, when. It's uh, 30 years. Yeah, time. I thought, you know, you, you print a, photo, a black and white photograph on a newspaper, it's a, they're, they're, all they are are dots, mm -hmm. you know? So if you can print a dot in ink, you can engrave a dot uh, by just taking, getting rid of the material. So we, f we worked out a photographic process in which you can take a photograph, reduce the photograph to you know, basically dots, and then the dots became reproduced in another way on a piece of rubber the rubber became then applied to the to the granite and it sandblasted through, in a very in a very new way. And they were so done we in had, a studio I, and then shipped. You no, know, we had we had uh, we, we did all this was done at Cold Spring Granite, in a facility. I mean, all of all of this was these are panels. These in Col the, Cold Spring, New York. There are forty one panels, about four about four feet uh, wide. In some places, they're 12 and a half feet tall. In other places, they're uh, seven feet tall. Cold Spring? At Cold New Spring. York? No. Okay. Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> okay. Back to your heritage. We'll get to that later. So, 
you know, so when I saw this, or, you know, originally when it was all put together for the first time, it was on a cold, snowy Minnesota day. And it was, ex it was just extraordinary because it was covered in snow and you could see everything. You see all the, we worked out all kinds of other ways. I mean, my, my office at the time was down in Greenwich Village. I would, I would have them make uh, two foot squares and we would test the, the engraving in all the kinds of different ways. The depth of the engraving, the size of the dots, the dots were a special kind of dot we, so that the dot would be granular in the sense that it would pick up the same grain technique that was in this, this granite, which is a, a, a granite from California. So uh, let, let's, look at, let's look at another series of pictures. So you, if you walk up close, see, I can't see it from where I'm sitting because it's, it's like we're, you know, a painting where you have to back well, up and, a little. And th but this is also very, this, this one, is, these are very, very close in. So that would be right. a smaller, one of those smaller images and so forth. So that what I wanted to do was to have the larger of the images about life size so that people would come and they would look and they would have a face-to-face -face contact with this individual. These are the individuals that were in Korea at the time and you wanted to see what they looked like. And tell because us about... They, they would be the same as, they would be the same as the when I did the research, I mean, they were the same kind of images that would be the soldiers in the Civil War or the soldiers that might be any other future war. So this became not just a memorial for Korea, but it was a memorial for all wars. Tell us about the figures that are in front of the mural. Th those, are, those are done by Frank, Frank Gaylord. Uh, you really want... <laughs> <laughs> well, if we had a glitch. It there the was a glitch time. along the way, and uh, so Frank Gaylord had uh, originally thirty-eight sculptures, and thirty-eight was too large for the area, so they decided to reduce it to nineteen. So thirty-eight was a reflection of the size of a platoon, which had 30, 38, but also the thirty-eighth parallel. So it was all kinds of numerology and so forth that was part part of the thing. Frank. Um, and, and, and Frank did an extraordinary job of putting together. One, each one of them had a certain job, let's say, in the military. And one was a forward observer, one was a Navy guy, one was a, one was a, a Marine, another one, a few were, uh, were, were Army, and so forth. But, uh, and, and they're walking with, you don't see them, you, they're, they're walking with M1 rifles and so forth up a little place. What had happened is that uh, at, at around this time, uh, uh, General Schwarzkopf had won the Gulf War over at the Gulf. And there was a big parade in New York here for him. And then there was a big parade down in Washington. At the parade in Washington, they decided to put out tanks and armor personnel carriers and artillery pieces and machine guns and so forth, all on the National Mall trying to get... The people who lived in Washington, D.C. didn't like it. They didn't like to see the implements of war. And we got word through the Fine Arts Commission because they're the people that would had the final say as to whether this was built or not. We were, we were just right at the verge of an approval at the time. They said, more than likely we wouldn't be approved because they're carrying M1 rifles and they were afraid it would, they, they were showing their military. So immediately I got together with Frank and I said, Frank, let's put ponchos on everybody and cover the M1 rifles, <laughs> have a breeze from behind so that there's some rippling and there's some sort of fragrance. So is that what you're after? <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting. I didn't even know that. That's a great story. Oh, you didn't know that story? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> that, wow. That's one of the glitches. So uh, while, you, while you sit down, I just want to tell people where these pictures came from. I was speaking today to, um, to Brian Lamb, who some of you may remember as the C-SPAN founder and host of Book Notes, et cetera. I know that he walks to the Lincoln Memorial and the Korea Memorial every day, every morning at about, for sunrise, no matter when it is, 7 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the summer. And I told him I was going to be talking to you today. He hasn't met you, but he said, I will send you the photographs I took this morning. 
So these are the photographs from this morning by the founder of C-SPAN. He loves, and he said, <laughs> also, there has been a recent rehabilitation, restoration, adding of names. Tell us what's, what's changed, because I know you went, you and Judy went to the rededication where it was less rainy, I guess. On, on, on the, um, the 26th, was it the 26th of July, um, we had the, uh, we, on the 26th of July, 26th. yeah, because that's the, that's the dedication of the, uh, of the ceasefire. In in Korea back in 1953, the, the uh, let me just try to try to get like the, the what the changes were made in the this words rehab. the yeah. words right at this time. There 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 were there was there was a, a movement um, within the foundation that they they wanted to have names of those that had died. In Korea at that time, so, and uh, we had he, we had done some preliminary work at that time to do it, and we just decided just to leave it at that particular point, and they decided to move forward with it. They hired a terrific architect to to um, to come up with the ideas of being able to do this. But we got the approval through Congress uh, to get that done. Con so Congress had approved the addition of names of those that were killed in Korea during 1950-1953 and, and, and also include a group of people who are the South Koreans who, soldiers, who are assigned to work with the, uh, the military and who work and fight with the military and they're called uh, producers. So, there are a little over 4,000 of them, and they were all also included, which is the first time that that was done uh, on any uh, United States property uh, around it. So, By so the way, you remind me that Brian told me this morning that when he got there at sunrise, there was a Korean family putting a flower on their, of course he inquired because that's what he does for a living, well, or did, so he inquired, they were, the descendants of a Korean advisor who had died in service. Well, you raise another subject, which is another, another story that I, I uh, where are we as far as time is concerned? We're okay. But I, uh, I, I'd want to tell that, that part of the story as well, because these are ex extraordinary people. Anyway, so what we basically decided to do, all these those sculptures are moving up alongside of this wall that you were seeing before up to up to a circular pool. So what they decided to do was to uh, enlarge this, not the size of the pool, but to take that pool and put a wall around, which is a low wall about this size, that would go around it. Now, when we figured out it would, if you put 40,000 names, even if the names are the size of the names that are on the Vietnam Memorial, it's, a, it's, it's, a football it's two football fields in length. So what they, what had they put was, was essentially a big, long arc around that area, and they put 4,000 names on here in, a ver in smaller type. And it looks absolutely terrific. It looks like this entire thing was was designed at, by the same group of people at the same time, in the same place. Because they, what they also did at the time was to. <coughs> th this is a th this was all put in at a peer, at a location in which this mar originally this this area on the mall was marshland, so and <coughs> they didn't put in uh, proper footings in the earlier days, so all new footings were put in for the entire area. Uh, they had they refurbished the entire area totally, and that essentially was paid for by the South Korean government. Really? To do it. So, so we yeah, now let me just tell you one thing about the South Koreans. Uh, <coughs> how to say it. So, we didn't know much about South. Co we didn't know much about Korea in those early days. But if you look at Korea and what they've done in the way of what I mentioned before about their gross national product, if you look at basically just about every flat screen TV is manufactured in Korea. 
um, in South Korea. Most of the major appliances that go into a kitchen is manufactured in South Korea. Uh, some of the better cars that you see running around are Korean cars that are on the American roadway. There is an extraordinary amount of, uh, of, of development here because it, Seoul is an extraordinary viable town. There are more designers being educated in Korea than in the United States, if there's a buts about it, in, in graduate school as well as undergraduate school. And the same with engineers and so forth. It's an extraordinary metropolis. If you were an American, they loved you over there. They are so dedicated to what America did for them as a country, it's just beyond you. If we had, if we have, as a country, I admire Truman so much because of what he did in those early days in bringing people over there to help. They love you. So what happens, they ha I, I, we were, Judy and I were sitting at a dinner a year or two ago, and the, the executive director of the foundation said, hey, Louis, you, you know, you're not here all the time. <laughs> um, and you don't know some of the things. But let me tell you one of the things that happens. We receive a lot of visitors from Korea. And these are Koreans that come over to, to the United States just to see what's happening in the United States. The first thing that most people come over is they get off the airplane, they, they're picked up by some sort of facility and they go to the hotel and they might take a nap or they go sleep over and they go have dinner and so forth. They want to go see the White House. For Koreans, they come over, they immediately come to the Korean Memorial. And there might be 40, there might be 30 or 40 people at a time. They come up to the wall and they all line up in, in the wall. They take their shoes off and they kneel. And some of them go prostrate and they pray. And I've never, I mean, I had tears in my eyes when I heard that because I've never designed anything that has that kind of strength for a group of people. And it's uh, amazing, just absolutely amazing. So the forgotten war is not forgotten, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. The thing that we are forgetting is that the, the soldiers that, that were over there at the time, they're, they're, they're dying off very quickly. We won't, we won't have very many left in a few more years. So. That's an amazing story. I'm going to give you all now an opportunity to ask some questions. So I think we have, um, do we have a microphone ready? Okay, wait for the mic because we're on Zoom. You had your hand up first, but we have a mic coming down right here, right in the front row. Thank you. Hi, um, this is an introduction for me uh, to this memorial. And I'm a little confused when I saw the, uh, the the granite, I guess, but it also looked like it was transparent because the tree behind it. So I was a little confused about how that. There was a tree, and it looked like the there was a tree in the granite also. I think you're what you're seeing is a tree that's actually behind the wall. Right. It, it, there's foliage and so forth that, that's behind there. But it was also looked like it was part of the granite. I don't know. I'm sorry. A I trick of the <laughs> eye. Let me let me give my. I, I went out of protocol here. I did want to give the first question because I am the Jonathan Fanton director, and Jonathan Fanton is here, <laughs> so Jonathan gets the first question, which I should have given to you first, with apologies. Thank you, Harold. Uh, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Proud of you. Um, <coughs> I love the book. Uh, you end the book by saying, and I quote, we only gain the future when we remember the past. The story is not about the memorial, but about the people of the memorial, not about yesterday, but of tomorrow. Not of what happened, nor why it happened, but about how we have changed and grown because of it. So let me ask you a personal question. What makes you as you go around the memorial and look at it, what makes you hopeful about the future? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And 
the um, I've come to this memorial at least once a year since I finished the work a long time ago. And I marvel at the number of people that are always there. Sometimes I wonder, is it, is it going to be empty? And it's never empty. I mean, and those statistics that I mentioned before, I mean, those statistics seem to be true. People come. In talking further with other other people, the uh, uh, the the older people, and a lot of a lot of the people that are there are veterans, but a lot of the people that have come there are young kids, and they're teenagers, and there are schools that come by, that are there. And some of them are, are just families that come by, that that. Um, that have the kids in strollers, or they're just uh, couples that walk down. And they are not kind of perusing this thing and, and then and walking off. They're walking with a sense of purpose. I got, I received a letter from a grandmother. I, re I receive letters from time to time at various times. They get less and less these days, but uh, this was a few, a number of years ago. And the letter said, "I'm with, um, I'm with a couple of my grandchildren, and my grandchildren are, are here. They like this memorial better than the others. It's on the National Mall because it has a sense of humanity, because it has people there. And it was written to me by." Madeleine Albright. <laughs> yeah, that's a short answer. <laughs> Tony Stepanski, you're, you're next. Hi. Um, could you go back to the photograph where you had the image of the faces of the men and uh, this one here? Yeah. So I believe you said the memorial was erected in 1992? Opened in 1992. This was... This, this was um, this was this is 19, uh, yeah, 92. We have finished it to 92. It was dedicated okay. in 1995. Fair enough. Okay, so, and I think you said uh, that these are based upon actual photographs of participants in the Korean War that they were taken from the early 50s. So around 1992, uh, the majority of these young-looking individuals would have been in their 60s. Was any effort made okay, to find them or to reach them eh, or to send images out saying, do you know this person, do you know these people, no. and bring them together? No, but, you know, but, I, re but I received um, what, what we decided in those early days, because I had a whole team go out to do all the research in all of the various places that have them. And we got thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of things. And what we have here is like 22, 2300. They represent all those that served. But they represent them anonymously. I, didn't ma I did not maintain their identity. Uh, or however, I'm receiving but things. But did you know their identity? Some, some people. Excuse me? I'm sorry, did you know their identities at the time this was being erected, or uh, was it I, irrelevant? I didn't, because I, I then just said, I, I told the team, don't let me see it, get rid of all that documentation, because they've got to represent everybody that's there. But has anyone come forward and said, that's me, We've that's had, my dad? I've had, you know, I'm I, sure I, hundreds. I did, I'd like to make that, that person there looks like my grandfather, looks like my, looks like my brother, looks like, you know, can you tell me where? And I so I, I've sent out a letter and so forth. But, but more than likely, it might be. It very much could be. Question here. Hello, I'm Clint Brownfield, and I went to Pratt too. And like Harold, I'm kind of interested in your process. Um, I was a graphic designer for like 25 years, thanks to Pratt. And I was wondering, during your process, did you have any conversations or contact with Maya Lin, who did the the Viet, Vietnam? Yeah, I sent I sent her a note. I sent her a note. I never got any any feedback uh, from Maya because they're both exquisite. I mean, they're really beautiful, well done. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
we have a question right here. Hi, how are you? My name is Atenas. I'm a student from BMCC. Um, when you first started, I didn't know your name to begin with. And at the beginning, I thought that you were doing these memorials to honor war. And then I realized that you were trying to honor the people that sacrificed their lives. And then I started admiring you as you kept talking. And I couldn't help to wonder, um, would I like to be remembered when I die? Would I like to have my name graved somewhere or a picture of me that everyone can see or my name in a book or something of that sort? And how does it feel to know that you've spent your life making memorials for the people that sacrifice their lives, for, for people that I'm sure you admire, even though you didn't know them. So how does it feel to know that you are going to be remembered like that? That your name is on books, that your name means something? That's a lovely how does that question. feel? Well, thank you. <laughs> I imagine it feels good, right? Because you deserve that. I haven't I haven't faced that yet. I really <laughs> haven't. In, in all honesty, you know, I, I uh, I'm I'm proud of what I've done, um, and I'm uh, I'm 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 just proud of what I've done, and I'm happy to have done it. And all you BMCC students, you have to remember, it's great that you're here, but you have to transfer to Hunter at some point, right? <laughs> we expect you to come to Hunter. Yes. Just curious if you ever had any interaction with uh, Ted Williams, particularly since it was back in 1992, with regards to uh, the memorial overall. I mean, he, you know, he started in World War II, but then he ended up flying again in uh, the mean, Korean you War. Mean, you mean the baseball player? The baseball no, player, yes. I'm not aware there's a Ted no. Williams politician. I'm sure you not had any. I'm not, not, I was a Yankee fan. <laughs> I'm so sorry I even asked it then. <laughs> so, or oh, one more we have here. Yes. Microphone coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and um, I'm with her. I'm oh with God. the tenants. <laughs> okay. um, yes. So thank you so much for 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 your talk and for your book and and, and for your art. Um, so one of the things we're doing in our, in our class at BMCC is we'll be giving uh, tours of virtual memorials honoring the pandemic. And there's uh, since I've been thinking about this a lot. There are some parallels in terms of forgetting, but also the lived experience of people. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak if, if, um, to that fact, that or that idea that you're not on, and you spoke about it initially, that it's not just about the dead, right? That, it, that it's also about that, um, the experience of the living. Is that okay? That's a, that, that, that's a, that's a long, um, th th process of thoughtfulness of how you pro approach that. I mean, it's really don't approach it that, that in a similar kind of way. Um, there's a John, John, John. That book about uh, John Kelly's book about the Black Plague, which is an extraordinary book to read, because he has uh, he's documented what those people went through over the over a period of time, uh, and I think that you know th these are life changing times. Uh, in many ways, uh, it, it, in what we are experiencing, right? Some are wearing masks, as you are, and some are not, like I'm not. Um, and, and as we leave here today, you'll continue wearing a mask, and there will be running into people in which our government has said it's okay not to wear a mask anymore. And I don't think it is. I mean, I think that we, we, should, we still have to wear masks, or I have to wear a mask anyway. So we raise that period of time where things, you know, don't have a reflection with everyone. And so there are always going to be differences of opinion. And I don't think that addresses the issue. 
Yeah. It bega- you're right. It's a very weighty, but that's a very, it's a very apt comparison as we all face challenges based on our having endured them somehow, and now we have another one before us that's not ended. Um, the only way to end a talk that's been so moving, an experience that's been very moving for me, is I just want to paraphrase something that Lewis wrote in his book. And remember, we have gone, we've talked about the memorial, we've talked about, uh, not enough about Lewis, which I wanted to do. He restricted me from spending time about his life, which I, anyway, I was forced not to talk about his amazing life in the army, his roots, his service to this country before he served it with his art. But anyway, you get the drift. Remember, we're at a book event, and this is an amazing reflection, not only on the work that Lewis did on this memorial, but on his views about other memorials. And um, I urge you to get it. And I just want to close with something that he wrote that I think is... um, beautiful and thought-provoking and appropriate to this evening's discussion. Walls arise, some crumble, some are built without reason, but none are built without meaning. And Lewis built his wall with great meaning. I mean, Robert Frost said something there is about a wall that he didn't like, but that's because he didn't know Lewis and did not know (laughs) this extraordinary monument. And we feel so privileged to have him for the chance to hear about it today. Uh, 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 thank you. you are such a dear friend. Thank you, Harold. Thanks.